Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Gillian. I'm the project manager for the Southwest Vascular Network, um, and we're going to be having a very interesting afternoon here today. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so we've got a webinar today on uh, specialist referral for lower limb issues and leg ulcers. So just a quick uh, bit of housekeeping. Um, please keep your videos off and please keep yourselves on mute. There'll be time for questions at the end and um, the slides will be circulated afterwards and we will be recording the um, session uh, which will be put onto our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, so just to give you a quick introduction to the network, it was established in 2016. It's a South East Vascular Network. It covers South East London and North Kent. Um, we've got a large population. We have various, um, we work on a hub and spoke model. So our hubs are, um, GSTT and Kings, and we also have some spoke sites out in um, Dartford and Gravesham, Lewisham and Greenwich, and Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells. And now I'd like to hand over to Mr. Biazzi for his presentation. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, actually, just now. Um, can you hear me okay? Because I'm con Yes, we can. Um, Thank you. Okay, good, good. So I'm going to share my presentation. So I thought, so first of all, as an introduction, uh, my name is Luke Labiasi. I'm a consultant vascular surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas's, and currently have uh, the, the privilege of leading our team in uh, um, complex lower limb surgery. Uh, we are the largest volume vascular units uh, for lower limb revascularization. Uh, and uh, as you can see, we are covering a catchment area of nearly 4 million uh, people. So we are very, very busy. And one of the key elements of uh, this uh, webinar is also to share with you the responsibility and the burden at the same time of uh, uh, working together uh, as a primary and tertiary referral center in such a large community and uh, with the impelling needs that our patients have in terms of lower limb ulcers and lower limb salvaging. So I would suggest that, that any of you that uh, is involved uh, with the assessment of patients that are presenting with uh, lower leg uh, conditions, so they should have, uh, at least in their practice, uh, those uh, two documents. These are the uh, most updated uh, uh, guidelines on the treatment of lower limb condition, focusing mainly on peripheral arterial disease. But as we will uh, show uh, soon, uh, these are the um, center of our practice, and they are the 2017 European guidelines on the management of a peripheral arterial disease, including intermittent claudication and patients presenting with rest pain and tissue loss, the so-called critical limb ischemia, and the more recent uh, uh, global uh, guidelines for patients with chronic limb threatening ischemia, which is the new uh, phrase to refer to patients that have a peripheral arterial disease and a tissue loss of rest pain. So you probably will come along with those two uh, acronyms, CLI, that stands for critical limb ischemia, and CLTI, chronic limb threatening ischemia. Those are pretty much synon synonyms and they refer to the same condition, but they may be used 
uh, in uh, different ways in different situations. And why do we need to think of a CLI or CLTI every time a patient is presenting with a tissue loss, a wound that is not healing within two weeks? Because this is the definition of, a, of an ulcer, any tissue uh, damage that is not healing in a fortnight. Um, we need to think of CLI and CLTI because uh, that is one of the main leading cause of uh, limb loss. Um, critical limb ischemia uh, is uh, also uh, described by um, the uh, Fontaine or Rutherford classifications. Uh, Fontaine is the European classification, Rutherford is the American. Uh, but as you can see, these are the uh, end spectrum of a condition that may develop in and present in uh, different ways. So the early presentation of peripheral arterial disease is quite asymptomatic. It may then evolve into claudication and uh, uh, in some instances uh, can develop into a limb threatening condition. Ischemic rest pain, minor tissue loss uh, can inevitably then lead to gangrene and the sepsis and death. Uh, by the way, just as a, a fun fact, uh, we use the term claudication because the uh, Roman Emperor Claudius was limping. So the Latin uh, doctors uh, started referring as claudication to describe the limping or, or the pain on exertion. Uh, why should we uh, differentiate quite clearly, uh, particularly in our referral pathways, between peripheral arterial disease with mild symptoms as claudication, with the PAD with tissue loss and ischemic rest pain, i.e. CLI and CLTI, because they are two totally different conditions in terms of a prognosis. So the pathophysiology is the same, is the blockages in the artery, but the actual uh, natural history and prognosis of the condition is different. Uh, as you can see in the yellow circles, the patients that have uh, claudication, uh, they are uh, facing a quite positive prognosis. Only 5 to 10 percent every year will uh, face the risk of a CLI and a potential amputation. Whereas the minority that present at your practice uh, or at your attention with these threatening symptoms of critical limb ischemia, luckily just a minority of 1 to 3 percent, at one year the half of them, they will be either dead or uh, without a limb. So CLI patients uh, have a, a very uh, um, negative prognosis. We can clearly very easily compare them to a uh, malignant uh, uh, cancer. And that's why we need to act swiftly. And that's why the uh, comprehensive uh, assessment is uh, is the key. Um, these tables are quite uh, probably now outdated by the um, uh, prevalence of uh, CLI in and PAD in the population. PAD was by definition a condition of the elderly, but uh, if you read uh, the uh, more recent uh, epidemiology publication on the Lancet, there is a clear shift of a PAD in younger population. We see more and more patients in their 40s and 50s with very aggressive uh, condition of PAD and uh, CLI. So we can, uh, uh, with no doubt, refer as to PAD as a global, global pandemic emergency. Uh, why it is so important that we work uh, collaboratively? because the treatment of PAD and CLI or CLTI starts with best medical therapy. Patients cannot have a successful surgery 
revascularization, endovascular treatment or bypass unless they are medically optimized. And the diagnosis and optimization, of course, starts in the primary care. And these are uh, the uh, level of evidence as provided by those two documents that we mentioned earlier the uh, European guidelines and the global guidelines. So there is a uh, level one, gra sorry, grade one level B, so quite a strong evidence to suggest that all patients that have uh, a suspected PAD, and in, uh, in other terms, every patient that have uh, a, a chronic leg ulcers and no palpable pulses, they should have an either ABPI assessment or a toe pressure assessment in your practice with no delay uh, of, of care. Um, and this is a key element. And for you, for the one are attending today that are in the uh, nursing profession, uh, I will say something quite controversial, but there are new uh, recommendation that have been published by the um, uh, the uh, National Wound Care Strategy Program. They're a mainly nurse-led uh, uh, recommendation where compression therapy is recommended regardless the ABPI or toe pressure assessment with just uh, the advice uh, to start on a light compression for patients that have the so-called red flags for PAD, waiting for a vascular assessment. But uh, I, uh, myself and my team, uh, we totally disagree with that. Uh, there is no way that you can safely start any compression or any aggressive wound care management of patients without an appropriate uh, vascular perfusion assessment, ABPI, or if diabetic, even better, the toe pressure assessment. And the very simple rule is that any patient with a chronic ulcer and ABPI less than 0.8 or a toe pressure less than 0.7 should immediately be referred for vascular assessment. Uh, what else? Um, Antiplatelet and anticoagula anticoagulant are also a key, and this medication needs to be started immediately. Just to update you on the new uh, guidelines, of course, uh, aspirin and statin are the so-called the best medical therapy, but the quite recent uh, evidence uh, suggested that all patients that have uh, um, have have experienced a cardiovascular event, hence secondary prevention, should should or could be commenced on what we call the uh, COMPASS trial, which is a combination of uh, uh, aspirin with a low dose of rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligram twice a day. Um, in all fairness, uh, this uh, randomized trial, despite being published on The Lancet, has uh, quite a significant limitation. Uh, some of them being, one, um, the, uh, um, the two cohorts uh, that were compared in the two ARM studies were patients on aspirin alone against the patient with aspirin and the rivaroxaban. There were no further comparison with any other antiplatelet such as clopidogrel or patients on dual antiplatelet. That's the main um, limitation in the methodology of the study. The second limitation is that, of course, this was a, a industry-led study by Bayern that, of course, is uh, uh, owns both aspirin and rivaroxaban. So always we need to be quite critical uh, about uh, these studies, but the level of evidence provided by the study is a level A evidence because it's a randomized controlled trial, and unfortunately there are no other trials of such kind that we can refer to. So the bottom line is patients with a PAD or other cardiovascular event could either stay on aspirin and statin, or even better, if there is no hemorrhagic risk, they could be also started on low-dose rivaroxaban. 
And uh, that's what we do after the patient undergoes a, a vascular intervention. This is a kind of a, a, a very similar study that was conducted on patients that had PAD CLI and underwent a bypass surgery or endovascular treatment, stent and angioplasties. The same evidence applies. Patients should benefit from the combination of an antiplatelet with an anticoagulant. Um, we, however, also are quite keen to keep many of our patients on dual antiplatelet or sometimes on a full therapeutic anticoagulation. But that's what you probably would could expect on our discharge letters to see a little bit of uh, heterogeneity in the um, in the anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy. Um, but that shows that, that the evidence is still quite lacking and we could work together to make it uh, stronger. What else can be done in the primary care to optimize the patient? Uh, as I said, optimize uh, the statin and the cholesterol control. The idea is that aspirin, uh, antiplatelet and statin um, maintain the intima of the artery smoother, preventing the uh, atherotomatous plaque to become uh, critical and vulnerable, and in other words, to create emboli that could affect the peripheral circulation. And of course, optimize the diabetes and look into the smoking cessation uh, program. Another key element that is all often uh, forgotten is the pain control. Patients should not wait to come and see the vascular team to start uh, uh, thorough and uh, uh, intense analgesia protocol. So please, uh, let's work together to keep our patients pain-free, because ultimately that is the key of our joint uh, efforts. Um, however, when it comes to wounds, to ulcers, it's not just a matter of ischemia, okay? ABPI, toe pressure, uh, is not that the only element. As we know, wounds are complex and are multifactorial. That's why uh, the uh, Vas American Vascular Society and uh, later on all the Vascular Society, including the National Wound Care Strategy Program, have embraced the new classification for describing and assessing ulcers, which is called the Wi-Fi classification. That stands for wound, ischemia, and the food infection. And that's where the multidisciplinary work comes in place. In, uh, in all our centers, we will have a vascular surgeon to assess the perfusion, um, a podiatrist and a, a specialist nurse to look at the foot and the wound and describe how extensive the wound is, and of course, ID and microbiologist to um, try to uh, identify and tackle the infective component of the ulcer. But of course, all the uh, classification systems have limitation. Uh, doesn't matter how many var variables we are considering, uh, we will never be able to identify every uh, patient just following a classification. That's why we firmly believe in a patient-centered care. Every patient is different, doesn't matter how they fit in any of the classifications you will see. So uh, knowing the patient, listening to the patient history and story, life story, family history, and looking at the at the ulcers, smelling, touching, that's what makes the patient unique. And that's how you need to um, custom uh, made and tailor your care for the patient. So we as surgeons, as nurses, we are strongly strong believer in a face-to-face -face assessment. Um, I want to now to introduce you uh, these new uh, guidelines that comes from the uh, Great Britain Vascular Society, and they are the uh, result of a study that was conducted by the GERFT, getting a right first time commission on the best practice for patients that have peripheral arterial disease. 
um, and is now being implemented in the Equality Improvement Framework as a sequin uh, for all the uh, UK hospital, with the exception of the London hospital for the moment, but that will be implemented soon in London as well. Uh, the idea is that in every network, uh, there is uh, uh, a quite significant number of patients that present with the CLI and potential limb loss. Actually, this project was designed with uh, the thought in mind that each network should comprise of 800,000 people. But as you probably know, the Southeast network is more is closer to 4 or 4.5 million catchment area. That means we are working on a three, four fold uh, volume than what the vascular society is, uh, is uh, thinking. Uh, but the expectation is that every day in our large network, we are probably facing with a C five critical limb ischemia and 25 diabetic foot infection um, that could potentially uh, lose their life or lose their limb. Uh, so that was the uh, temporal, the, 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 the evolution of this project from GERF to the vascular guidelines to now be a sequin and is also been extended in the 23-24 sequin as well. Um, as all the sequence, there are multiple targets, which I'm not looking into it, but that's what it all comes down to. It all comes down that all patients with a threatened leg should have immediate referral and intervention. Patients that end up in hospital uh, should be treated within five days from the admission. That means we have only three to four days uh, to reach uh, a, a diagnosis, have the images uh, and uh, custom made the appropriate treatment for the patient and have access to theaters to perform the surgery. For patients that stay in the community, so that applies to you uh, more uh, closely, uh, patients that are managed as outpatient should be having treatment within 14 days. And the clock starts when you in your practice and uh, for the uh, GP present or the specialist nurse, the practice nurse that normally have first access to uh, the patient, the clock starts with your referral. So we are committing to see the patients referred uh, from you um, within a week. Within a week from your referral, we should see the patient, have a CT angiogram, which is the cross-sectional imaging and is the uh, uh, gold standard uh, vascular imaging for patients that will undergo surgery. And uh, we have a further week, the second week to bring the patient to hospital for discussion and uh, arrange a operating slot for it. It's a very, very ambitious uh, project. And the project itself was launched uh, with uh, uh, the small print saying that this is ambitious, is very difficult to achieve. And the reality is that uh, with within the constraint of NHS possibility, it is going, it has been a huge, huge task. At St. Thomas's, despite being the, or probably because we are the largest volume center in the country, together with Birmingham in treating lower limbs, we are, um, we are not really being successful so far in achieving these uh, targets for our patients. We are still between the 30, and uh, only with some peak at 40% of success. Um, but my take on this is that in order to succeed, other than increase the NHS capacity in the uh, tertiary centers in the big London hospital, having more theaters, more hybrid uh, um, theaters for, for these patients, we need to shorten the gap 
between the referral and the first assessment. We need to work closer. Um, we need to find a way of communicating directly. No delay can be uh, justified at this at this stage. OK, so this is the breakdown of the what, what I've just said. OK, so there are um, everything is timed very strictly. So it's not just about the surgeon. It's not just about uh, getting the patient to hospital. It's about working, working together. And we are working hard. OK, you can see all these complex pathways that we are trying to develop. Um, I have to say the probably so far only positive story is the our uh, EVC, the emergency vascular clinic that we have set up in, in London. That is the only setting where we are winning with the sequin targets, uh, but possibly we should expand that in the community. And I believe my colleague Chloe, Chloe will discuss about the EVC in a few minutes. Um, so where, where are we in terms of uh, vascular surgery? OK, so uh, there has been a huge shift in the treatment of our patients because actually uh, so far all of the attention when it comes to improving the blood supply has been on how can we make the arteries larger? How can we get the flow better? And uh, we are all focusing on all these old school uh, kind of physics. Uh, if we improve this the lumen in the artery, if we get luminal gain, if we open up the artery, we'll have a better flow to the foot and we are going to save the foot. That's kind of an old story, OK? Uh, and that's what we used to do, I would say, almost in the past. Either do plain balloon angioplasty to stretch the artery, uh, of course, using stents uh, and, uh, and bypassing the blockage with uh, with surgery, taking a vein and doing bypass. And I have to say, we are still doing that, but the mentality has changed, OK? Uh, we have introduced a new element. We have realized that, that actually arteries and the circulation system is much more complex than we as plumbers, as surgeons, we may think. It's not just a getting flow through a conduit. Uh, there are the physics behind it is much more complex and there are concepts like especially compliance uh, that we are introducing because we know that patients especially elderly patients that have stiff arteries calcified arteries it's not just about improving the flow it's also about making those artery more compliance more compliant to disrupt the calcium. As you can see from this diagram, the more calcified the arteries are, and the calcifications are usually the result of age, gender, men, but also chronic kidney disease, uh, smoking, and, uh, um, and diabetes, um, and patients that have, for example, they are on dialysis for years. So if we can improve the compliance together with improving the flow, we uh, we could potentially get better better outcomes, and that's why uh, we have uh, introduced a very revolutionary technology in our practice. So the two big uh, elements now are the atherectomy. You probably have heard that in our letters or in our uh, post op. Uh, uh, letters and clinic letters. Rotational atherectomy and the shock wave are the two big things. Rotational atherectomy is basically a sort of a drilling device that we are using. It's a keyhole procedure um, with these catheters that not uh, have a twofold uh, ability. One is with the blades, they drill uh, through the blockage, and especially if the, the blockage is a calcified, organized structures. He, uh, debulk the blockage and then they have an aspirational uh, port that aspirate all these debris as they are performed, as they are produced. OK, I don't go into the technicalities, but in doing so, debulking um, the, uh, the blockage not only creates space, luminal gain, but also 
remove the calcium and the other uh, structure, the, the core of the ateroma from the intima and expose the artery, the media and the adventitia from receiving the therapeutic drugs. Because the, the idea is to use atherect atherectomy device together with the drug eluting balloon so that the drug, uh, the eluting drug is absorbed better within the artery and the adventitia. Um, I know the, the time is limited, but just I want to give you some, some example. So this is a patient with very small uh, artery. This is the femoral artery is all calcified. You see the white calcification in the, in the leg, and that's how on the uh, angiogram it looks like, like a blockage. So what we do is we drill, let me see if uh, there are some animation. Um, we drill through the blockage, uh, most often using a filter that also helps uh, protect him from the emboli. And uh, following the, the drilling, we then balloon, either with plain balloon or drug eluting balloon. And that is very useful to restore the flow, but also restore the compliance of the vessel. You can see before and after. And, uh, this is a revolutionary because that this is is lowering the need for stenting. Not that stents are bad. We still use the stents uh, in a certain situation. We use stents as a bailout situation. Um, but uh, this is what in uh, in Latin we call restitutio ad integrum. That means we restore the full integrity of the artery without any metal work. Okay. Uh, this again is another example. You can see actually here in the video, the little drilling catheter going through a previously blocked stent. And that's the final run. Again, a, a very nice flow. Uh, okay, these are technicalities about the risk of embolization which I will uh, ignore. And this is the other second uh, kind of uh, new new story, the, the new, uh, the new uh, technique that we are using is called shockwave. It's the same concept of the uh, nephrolithiasis, so the uh, shockwaves that are used to dissolve uh, the kidney stones. Um, we have now built the balloons uh, that have these in integrated emitters. So there is an electric impulse that uh, via cable is uh, transformed into a bubble, a water bubble that becomes a sonic wave. And that sonic waves is then uh, transmitted to the wall of the artery via balloon. The balloon is not inflating much, it's not causing any dilatation but is simply allow, allowing the sonic wave to bounce within the artery and to disrupt the calcium. You can see what happens here in, in vitro. Okay, the sonic waves are literally breaking down the calcium in the arteries. Okay, and that's uh, the, uh, uh, an example. It was my first case of a shockwave treatment of a patient just before COVID that was in uh, in uh, February 2020. Patient presenting with a mixed uh, ulcer. This clearly was was a venous also component, oedema, but remember the importance of uh, uh, ABPI and PAD it was not just venous, was mainly arterial. There was a chronic occlusion of the femoral and popliteal artery uh, so that was uh, tackled with this technique. So the, the lesion was crossed, the shockwave balloon was uh, activated, and, and that's uh, the result, okay? Uh, the artery perfectly restored, and even without compression, because at the time during COVID, it was very difficult to have uh, direct access uh, to uh, care, unfortunately. But uh, despite that, uh, uh, Quite a long journey, but the patient uh, is fully is fully healed. Um, this is an example where we use a combination of the two techniques. So the, the drilling 
technique for the femoral popliteal artery above the knee, and then uh, the shock wave uh, ballooning uh, of the small artery in the lower leg uh, with a very good result. So that's uh, just to point out that there is this constant paradigm shift in our clinical practice, and that's why our practice is, is changing uh, continuously. Um, so let me skip that uh, just to get to the conclusion. Um, just uh, just uh, to touch uh, only on that, uh, just to uh, introduce a new technology that we are using. We are also using intravascular ultrasound. So not only we use all these toys uh, to change the compliance of the artery, but now we have also catheters that goes into the arteries and allow us to assess the artery within uh, the inside, within uh, the lumen, and adjust our practice uh, accordingly. So in, in conclusion, um, my main message for you all is that every patient that you see or is presenting to your practice with uh, an ulcer should at some point seen by a vascular surgeon. If there are indications of a peripheral arterial disease, low ABPI, absence of pulses, that referral needs to be immediate. If you think the patient has, on the contrary, a venous ulcer, uh, um, then we can work in a slightly more relaxed uh, uh, time frame, but still the patient should see a vascular surgeon to try to identify the underlying reason of the venous problem. Because we know, probably you are aware, that there, the new trials uh, called EVRA trials have shown that all patients that have a leg venous ulcer benefit from compression, providing that the arteries are okay, plus varicose vein treatment if there is a reflux in the superficial veins. So if the, the ulcer is arterial, immediate referral. If it's venous, you, we can work in a more delayed uh, pattern, but still uh, we need to uh, rule out the need for surgery. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very thank much, you very much BLC. BLC. Okay, okay, I'd like, I'd to, like hand to hand over to Chloe. Chloe. I'll just, just share, my, share screen my screen with your slides, with your slides Chloe. If everyone else, everyone else could put themselves onto mute, please. Thank you. Perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Chloe, and I'm one of the uh, vascular nurse practitioners at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, so leading on quite nicely from Lukla's presentation, um, I'll be talking through our EVC clinic, so our emergency vascular clinic, um, and talking you through sort of our inclusion criteria and how you can refer to us. Um, so next slide, please, Gillian. Thank you. Um, so EVC initially started in 2017 as kind of a A&E sort of admission avoidance initiative really. We were getting a lot of um, pressure on A&E and admissions and it was to set up to try and avoid some of that and speed up um, pathways such as the CLI pathway. Um, so it's ran by uh, three full-time nurse practitioners, a uh, nursing assistant with a consultant on board throughout the week as well uh, for review and sort of planning, as well as um, an admin team who manage all of our active referrals and administration. Um, the referral is dependent, so it's not a service where we offer walk-in, so referrals are mandatory um, just so that we can manage sort of expectations uh, for the patients and for the department. Next slide, please. So our inclusion uh, criteria includes um, TIA patients who have a confirmed diagnosis of carotid stenosis. Um, so these patients tend to come from our network hospitals, not so much from, from you guys. 
Um, CLTI without sepsis, so anyone that is clinically unwell should be going via A&E as opposed to through us, but um, patients that Mr Biassi alluded to with sort of tissue loss and features of night pain, rest pain can be coming through to us to sort of achieve that five day um, sort of pathway of getting them revascularized in a timely manner. We do you see patients with diabetic foot ulcers, but only if they have features of peripheral arterial disease and if you're worried about CLI. If they are diabetic foot ulcers only, we would suggest that they go through the sort of foot health team um, instead. We see acute DVT patients as well, but only iliofemoral because we're off able to offer sort of surgery to them. Anything sort of below the knee should be going through A&E and through their usual uh, pathways. New symptomatic uh, pre-existing venous patients we see as well. So anyone that we've previously operated on or stented with a venous stent, we can see um, probably won't be as uh, sort of relevant to you guys. But if you do see any of our patients that have been uh, stented and you're concerned about a new clot, we can see them as well. Um, digital ischemia, so anyone that has discoloration of the fingers or the toes um, and you think there might be a vascular component, then refer to us. We can get expedited imaging such as duplex imaging and CT um, and come up with a plan for them. New leg ulcers, so on a Friday we run a leg ulcer clinic which is practically nurse led. So. Um, it's a slightly different referral process. I'll go through through that with you. But if they don't have any uh, diagnosis, so if there's no known arterial or venous disease and you're concerned that there's a vascular component, we can see them. Um, if there isn't any vascular component, we'll also come up with a, a sort of an expert dressing plan and refer them on to the relevant um, uh, clinicians going forward. We also see uh, patients who have been in for uh, as an inpatient on our wards for surgery and if they need any sort of expedited uh, wound care post procedure, we can see them. So if you are seeing any of our patients who have been operated on, you're worried about any of the wounds, referring straight to us for sort of early assessment is always a really good idea and we're more than willing to give you some advice on that. Um, acute on chronic limb ischemia, so patients that are known to us who have had maybe stenting or bypasses and there's worry about new um, ischemia, we will see them, scan them, check to make sure that all their stents and things are OK as well. Um, another nurse led component is our, it's sort of fairly new, but is working really, really well at patients who have superficial thrombophlebitis or bleeding varicose veins. Um, we can ex expedite seeing them sort of Monday to Friday, get them a duplex scan and um, sort of process them through our expedited um, varicose vein surgical pathway, if of course appropriate and the patient fits the criteria. Um, finally, we see incidental findings of abdominal aortic aneurysms, obviously non-tender and for patients that aren't at sort of immediate risk of rupture. Um, we see a lot of the national screening patients as well that come through to get them kind of operated on if appropriate in a timely manner. But this tends to be EV consultant only clinic. Um, the nursing team don't tend to get involved with those patients. Next slide, please, Gillian. So we do have an exclusion criteria as well, just to keep, because obviously it's an outpatient setting, just to keep the patients and us safe. Um, so we don't see any patients who should be going through A&E. So anyone that's acutely unwell, such as sepsis, um, bleeding, any kind of a new acute limb presentation, um, they're all better off going through through sort of the A&E pathway. Obviously, a ruptured um, or tender symptomatic AAAs, diabetic foot ulcers without sort of peripheral arterial or CLTI um, features. Um, bed bound patients as well, unfortunately, just because our patients can be with us for quite a long time throughout the day and we don't have the facilities to, you know, um, get them onto a hoist to the toilets and things. So that would be better going through A&E as well. Um, in patients, so we do get quite a lot of network referrals referring patients who are currently still in patients. Um, we just like to make sure that they are discharged safely and sort of medically fit for discharge before they see us as well. And um, our nurses are all adult trained, so we're, we're not able to see anyone under the age of 18. Next slide. Um, so what the patients can expect, so um, once we've received the referral and vetted um, and made sure that the, the patient's appropriate, 
Uh, they'll be seen by one of the nurse practitioners and we carry out a full physical assessment. Um, so looking at, you know, lower limb um, fully and or organising any investigations depending on our findings and of course the comorbidities associated with the patient. So we'll be doing things like bloods to check for inflammatory markers, um, renal function, etc. particularly if we want to be ordering more invasive Im imaging such as a CT. Um, duplex imaging is usually good for a start unless it's sort of obvious CLTI where we tend to proceed straight to CT if of course renal function is okay. Um, we can also do things like foot x-rays to check um, for things like osteomyelitis as well, which is really, really helpful. Um, a couple of our nurse practitioners are prescribers as well, so we're able to sort of help out with initiating best medical therapy and optimising any kind of statins, blood pressure medication, all that kind of thing, as well as initiating on pa uh, patients on antibiotics as well, for which is really helpful for things like um, for infection and ulceration. Um, consultant consultation. So once we've kind of got everything together, our consultants will uh, come and assess the patients as well, counsel them on the options going forward um, and just kind of set expectations really um, with, with the sort of the rest of the patient pathway. Um, so plans include, as I've said, it'll either be expedited treatments. So particularly if they are CLTI, we have quite a, a rigorous scheduling process where we try to get these patients scheduled as soon as possible for revascularization if needed. Um, obviously, we don't offer surgery if we don't think that it's going to benefit the patient or not in their best interest. So we'll obviously make sure that they're OK with conservative management, with dressing plans, etc. And if it's not vascular at all and ends up being something different, we'll manage that onward referral. Um, it's often a full day appointment, so we advise our patients that they can often be with us from sort of half eight, half nine throughout the day, just while we get all the assessments and imaging done um, and obviously uh, waiting for transport and things like that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so how to refer. So the main way to refer to us is through refer a patient. So um, the direct sort of link is on there for your use. Uh, you don't need to sign up or anything like that. Any clinician can use it as long as you've got a valid NHS uh, email account. Um, so you just follow the links for the new referral and obviously select St Thomas's and vascular surgery. Just a note to say that all of these referrals are vetted by a vascular registrar. And of course, if you want someone to be seen in EVC, there is no guarantee that they will be seen if it's not deemed appropriate. All of these referrals tend to be kind of thoroughly discussed with a consultant team in, a, in our morning meeting. So it may be that the patient takes a slightly different pathway. Um, so for anyone sort of within that inclusion criteria, refer via refer a patient. If they are a chronic sort of a uh, leg ulcer patient and not CLTI doesn't need immediate uh, kind of review. We can see them in our EVC ulcer clinic and you can refer via to that via your usual sort of ERS uh, route and they'll still get seen within a couple of weeks. Um, so that's how you can refer to us. Next slide. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks very much, Chloe. That was really interesting. Um, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for either of our speakers? I don't know if there's anything in the chat. Um, Julian, while while you we are asking questions, if you don't mind, I found a kind of a conclusive uh, uh, slide uh, that I will put on uh, while we're waiting for. Okay. Yes, which uh, kind of uh, very simply summarize what our kind of uh, uh, algorithm in uh, vetting the lower limb conditions. OK, so I would say that what Chloe has just mentioned about EVC uh, fits in, in mainly the urgent one. OK, uh, whereas all the other could be uh, dealt uh, uh, in, a, in a more outpatient setting, providing that EVC also are very good in uh, uh, treating uh, varicose bleeding and uh, uh, referring patient through the leg ulcer pathways. But um, when we are focusing on the critical limb ischemia, that's where EVC or urgent pathway with your local vascular service should take uh, uh, should come into into the equation.
Thank you very much. I don't think there are any questions. Does anyone have anything for either of our speakers? Otherwise, I'm just going to share my screen for the final slide. Oh, there's one question from Amy. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm clinical lead and head of the amputee service at GFTT. So I'm based up in um, Bowley Close at the Prosthetic Centre um, and we don't have a consultant at the moment. So Chloe's nodding her head, you will have had some referrals from us. Um, but, and we take patients from all over the place. Um, so I've got two questions. Firstly, Mr. Biassi, how do you decide between using the shockwave versus the fancy drill? So that's the question for you. And also with EVC, if we know a patient is under, say, Lewisham or somewhere a vascular team down in Darrant Valley, but we were concerned and we weren't getting any responses from their local team, could we refer to you? Hi, Amy. Yes, uh, very, very, very spot on question. So how to use the, the technology? Uh, that, of course, is, uh, is, is a topic of uh, lots of conversation even be between us. Um, my, the main message is that uh, there, all the technology works uh, if it's uh, used appropriately. So there is no one solution for all. Uh, is all about case selection. So, in as you as we know in our profession, is about using the right tool for the right person at the right time. So, mm -hmm. I won't go into very big technicalities, but as you can imagine, shockwave wor works very well for very extensive calcifications uh, only. Uh, the other technique works better when uh, there is a combination of calcium and the fresh atheroma that we want to suck out before it goes everywhere in the foot and thrashes the foot, uh, uh, losing the circulation uh, in, in the more distal territories. Um, but the key is the technology is great, uh, but we need to be still be wise and yeah. use our head, uh, not just artificial intelligence, to apply the right tool to the right person. Uh, in terms of EVC within the network, uh, um, Chloe, correct me if I'm wrong, but yes, you, you have complete access to EVC regardless of your local uh, vascular team. Reality is that uh, in all the spoke hospital, we have, uh, we have outpatient clinics and I personally, I'm in Tunbridge Wells, uh, I try to create a slot also for emergency, out, uh, starting my clinic an hour earlier, finishing an hour later, um, but we are quite overwhelmed. So it is absolutely appropriate if you think your referral fits in the urgent uh, mm -hmm. scenario to send uh, a referral patient uh, referral. If you think it is a time constrained emergency like uh, acute ischemia or sepsis and uh, then you need to speak to the vascular team on call. Yeah. So the, the, the rule is uh, uh, still send a referral patient, uh, prioritizing as the emergency, but uh, also call our uh, vascular on call team, a reg and consultant, uh, to explain the situation. Okay, thank you. And from a really practical note, um, do if if you weren't able to see a patient that day, but it was the next day, is is there patient transport or do they have to get themselves in? I can't remember what we've done. Yeah, for, yes. for, for DVC. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Chloe, Chloe, you can. <laughs> yeah, we can um, arrange transport. That's no problem. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't and remember. Thank you. We'll, um, we'll call either you guys or the patient and just assess whether they need transport and arrange it. So that's always not a problem. And just by way of sort of reiterating how good the service is for the other people it, who've dialed in today, we've referred quite a few patients to you because we're standalone. We're worried about the patient. Um, and it's always the it's a really easy referral process and the communication's always been really good. I just wanted to say as well on that note, um, I didn't mention it because I didn't want to cause too much confusion, but um, for patients sort of linked to our um, uh, ARU units um, and are known to vascular, we do have an internal referral form, which 
is essentially a Word document that can be used for patients that are already known to us if they need multiple visits. But as a rule, it should go via refer a patient. So if, if you need to send the internal referral form, that's fine as well. I think we've got both. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or whatever takes your fancy. <laughs> Thanks both. It's just only a question in the chat in the chat. Um, you mentioned 20 to 50 percent with PVD is asymptomatic. As a GP, how can I identify these patients and refer them? Yes, uh, um, so it all comes about uh, presentation symptoms and signs of disease. That's why uh, face to face is paramount. So uh, asymptomatic, uh, I wouldn't say asymptomatic, non-critical uh, CLI are patients that are claudicant, um, that may have uh, low ABPI or low toe pressure, but without either rest pain or tissue loss. Those are the two red flags of critical limb ischemia, the two elements that uh, allows the diagnosis of CLI. So patients that have tissue loss that has not healed within two weeks or rest pain in the context of uh, any suspicious element of uh, peripheral arterial disease, a low ABPI. Uh, I'm happy even for you to say I cannot feel the pulses in the foot because that sometimes is even more important than ABPI. I cannot recommend that uh, uh, without, uh, without the appropriate training, but sometimes ABPI are erroneous. Uh, they may not uh, provide the right uh, digit, the right number, the right reading. Uh, and an experienced uh, doctor or an experienced nurse uh, can actually rely on the presence of pulses as felt in, in the foot. But that's basically uh, the uh, description of a CLI patient. Rest pain or tissue loss or both and any sign of a poor circulation. What I would suggest is that uh, don't over refer claudication because Ultimately, the guidelines strongly advise against any surgery. And there are multiple reasons, because even the main reason is that even a successful surgery will inevitably uh, position the patient in a, in a more difficult situation years to come. So patients that have early surgery to improve their walking distance, even when that is successful in the shorter term, they will come back in years to come with more threatening symptoms, either because the stent is blocked, the angioplasty has recoiled. So we should not operate on claudication unless severely impairing the quality of life. And that is not the 80 year old that can walk 50 yards. That is the 50 year old that cannot go to work and loses the income as a matter of, of that. Uh, so please try to, if possible, to medically optimize these patients. Claudican, the best uh, uh, treatment for Claudican is a structured walking exercise. So encourage patients on the regular exercise. Uh, please don't refer claudication as a matter of inconvenience. Don't refer patient just because they have an ABPI that is low than 0.8, but without symptoms of critical ischemia, because we won't do anything different of, from what you do. Actually, you do it much better, which is the medical assessment and optimization. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we must leave it there. We've just slightly run over time, but thank you ever so much, all of you for attending. Please do complete our feedback survey and you'll get a certificate of attendance for CPD. I hope you found it all very useful. Please do contact me and my email address is there if you have any queries and we will be sending the slides around afterwards. And yeah, wish you all a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.